Over the years, while many of his university colleagues preferred teaching graduate students, Eric Vogelin was most alive standing before a class of undergraduates. Tilo Schabert remembers Vogelin's ability to turn dense philosophical subjects into classroom theater. He struck us by, by his youthful mind, his youthful behavior. Uh, in the lecture room, he, he, he really was a great performer. It was a theatrical event uh, to uh, uh, watch him uh, giving a lecture. Timothy Fuller discovered Vogelin as a college freshman. He was one of the people who introduced me to the fact that almost all important political thinkers in the history of Western political thought had connected politics and religion. And what happens when powerful political movements turn into virtual religions, nurturing the notion among true believers that non-believers are worthy of sacrifice in the name of the greater glory of the cause? Uh, Vogelin is one of those great 20th century prophets or voices in the wilderness, in a sense, warning us and calling our attention to the abyss which is opened up by that sense of unlimited human power. For Vogelin, when a society becomes self-appointed uh, as representatives of humanity and empowered to destroy the rest of humanity in order to purify it, that's no longer a, a state of order, but a profound state of disorder. It was the philosopher Hegel who referred to the majority of people as victims on the slaughter bench of history. Scholars, in fact, calculate that during the 20th century alone, governments killed nearly 120 million of their own citizens. Marxist governments, 95.2 million. By comparison, war-inflicted deaths totaled another 35.7 million people. He was someone who uh, gave cognizance to the fact that uh, the 20th century is probably the bloodiest century in human history. Human existence, Vogelin believed, depends on man being able to survive what he called climates of opinion that build iron curtains of the soul that in turn keep society from asking questions about the misdeeds of its leaders. Getting to those root ideas required exhaustive research. Like Plato, Vogelin referred to himself as a philosopher and scientist, trying to make sense of reality by using empirical evidence. Vogelin was not opposed to science. In fact, he called himself a scientist and at one point considered making a career of mathematics. His best known book was The New Science of Politics. Vogelin's big achievement was that his new science of politics was more than an elemental analysis of power or group processes. It was a new way to look at man, an analysis that rested on the Greek and Christian visions of philosophy, as well as a careful study of the origins of Christianity and its influences on thinkers and political leaders down through the ages. While he was a non-practicing Christian, Vogelin was nonetheless a man of faith, who also authored detailed explorations of the Bible. Those studies led him, during a 1963 interchange with famed historian Arnold Toynbee, to question the very use of the word religion. I'm very uh, doubtful about the value of using the term religion at all. You see, for the larger part of the history of mankind, nobody knew that they had religion. And in the uh, 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 Bible, for instance, the term does not occur at all. No matter how it was defined, Vogelin knew more about religion than most believers. Eric Hermann Wilhelm Vogelin was born in Cologne on January 3, 1901 and grew up in Vienna. As a child, he lost himself in the fairy tales of Hans Christian Andersen. An embarrassing incident in a high school science class, however, may have seared his intellect with a lifelong obsession for knowing all he could about everything he studied. When a teacher asked him to identify a source of citric acid, young Eric drew a blank on the answer, squeezing lemons. 
and I thought there was some complicated chemical process involved which had something to do with the chemical composition. And then I was thundered down as an egregious jackass because I didn't know that citrus acid is obtained by squeezing lemons. I got a bad grade in that semester. Vogelin went on to study political science at the University of Vienna, where he was awarded a doctorate in 1922. For three years during the late 20s, he was a Rockefeller scholar at Columbia, Harvard, Yale, and the University of Wisconsin, followed by a year in France, before returning to Vienna, where he served on the law faculty at the University of Vienna. In March 1938, the Nazis forced administrators to fire him because he told classes Nazi race theories were propaganda aimed at demonizing Jews. Only hours after Vogelin finished one lecture, a Gestapo agent showed up at his front door. There, there came a Gestapo man to the door and said uh, he wanted to talk to my husband. And I said, he's not home. And he said, tell him to come home and because we want to have your passports. And, my pa and I said, uh, uh, yes, uh, I will do what we can. And uh, I went to my brother's office and he said, you are lucky. Your passports came in this morning with the Swiss visa in, in it already. So Eric packed his two bags and left the house immediately. And uh, um, I, I told him that there was a train going to Zurich only the next morning. And I told him not ever to, 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 not to try to come back home during the night, to rather to sit it out in a coffee house because these people were after him. Eric first, then Lissy, fled to Switzerland, eventually emigrating to the United States where he joined the Harvard faculty as a part-time lecturer. At Harvard, Vogelin began what would become the project of a lifetime. I, I, he said, I'm writing a history of uh, political ideas. And I said, where do you start? Oh, he said, from the beginning, everything, everything. That idea grew into a 4,000-page manuscript, the history of political ideas. He moved from the notion of political ideas being a series of uh, abstract thoughts, which then have applications in this society or another to trying to get to the experiences behind the dominant symbolisms of societies. To do that, Vogelin traced symbolism through antiquity. Trajan's column in Rome, for instance, is a good example of his theories about how consciousness is formed. The column's bas-relief panels depict victories by the first century Roman Emperor Trajan, telling the glorified stories of real events that, in turn, form the only version available of what happened on the battlefield. Vogelin went further back to the prehistoric cave drawings in Plato's parable of the cave, the story of prisoners chained to the floor, their backs to a fire, facing a wall where shadowy stick-figured depictions of life on the outside were projected on the wall in front of them. According to Plato's story, when a prisoner escapes and is drawn to the light of the outside world, he discovers a different version of reality, a vision of the divine good. Drawing on Plato's story, Vogelin reasoned that since governments rest on symbols of shared experience, if their interpretations of reality go to pieces, their institutions fall apart too. 